Privit, Privet, greetings from Kharkiv. I'm here in the east of Ukraine, and actually the Russian border is just 20 kilometers north of here. Donbass is a little bit further down there to this. Well, it's going to be down there, I guess, to the south of the city. And in the last few weeks, I've been receiving a deluge of questions from guys asking me what the hell is going on here between Russia and Ukraine. Is Putin, President Putin of Russia, planning to invade Ukraine again? Uh, a more extensive invasion than we've seen down in Donbass or in Crimea. And, you know, I've been living in this region for about a decade. I actually have a background in international relations with a specialization in this region in the former Soviet Union. I speak Russian and some Ukrainian, so I can kind of follow what's been going on here and what is likely to happen in the next few months. Actually, the reason why I'm in Kharkiv is that I've been here with a client living the Tsar experience together, been out enjoying the nightlife here in Kharkiv in particular. So I'll probably give an indication about how life has been going on as normal pretty much. And I should say, just before I get started, you should see it there in the view. I should be just up there, wherever it's gone. It is the 25th of December. So Merry Christmas if you are celebrating Christmas today here in Ukraine. Uh, Christmas is actually celebrated twice now, both on the 25th of December, what they call Catholic Christmas locally and on the 7th of January, which is the Orthodox Christian Christmas. So some seasonal fare as we get into, actually so it's another thing to say is that uh, because I just got a little video clip 30 years ago today, Mikhail Gorbachev basically resigned. It was his last day as the Premier of the Soviet Union. And this is very pertinent to what has been happening in the last few weeks. So 30 years ago today, the Soviet flag was lowered over the Kremlin and the Russian Federation flag was raised. So quite a relevant day, quite apt that I'm shooting this video today on the 25th of December 2021. Anyways, I'm going to outline the roots of the current conflict, what has been happening. I'm going to try and distill it down for you to make it a little bit more easy to follow in terms of the key, two key issues that are driving all this tension in the last few weeks. And then I'll answer, you know, the most common questions that I'm asked about uh, Russia and Ukraine and all this kind of conflict over the last few years. And then at the end, I'll tell you exactly what I think is going to happen next. So is it all bluster in the Western media or is there a real reason, genuine reason to be concerned about what's going on? Let's get into the video. Bye, Ekele. Sar experience. So firstly, let me just tell you a little bit what it was like here in 2014, just after the uh, last revolution in Ukraine, the Euromaidan or Revolution of Dignity. Uh, I was actually here in Kharkiv just after uh, the change of government. And you know, you had Russia in the process of annexing Crimea and also the conflict starting in Donbass further down that way. And actually on this street corner, it was here on a Saturday, it's also Saturday today, it's a little bit like deja vu, <clears throat> except for there's more snow. There was a pro-Russian uh, demonstration just on that corner over there. And there were these, I guess there was maybe 50 or 60 guys uh, looking very kind of military marching down, black jackets shouting uh, skinheads, <laughs> shouting Russia, Russia. And lining was a group, lining the street was a group of old Babushke uh, waving Soviet flags, shouting the same thing, Russia, Russia, even though they had a Soviet flag, not the Russian flag in their hand. And that's kind of a segue into what the root of the conflict is about. And that is, to borrow a phrase from the former US president, uh, Bill Clinton, it's the economy, stupid. That's what he used to great effect as a slogan uh, when he was running for president back in the early 90s. And that's actually really what it comes down to. 
uh, especially when we're talking about those, you know, babushka grandmas who are there waving their Soviet flags. Now, why would they be out there waving the Soviet flag? Do they want to return to Marxism? Well, pensions are higher in Russia <laughs> than they were in Ukraine in 2014. So they were kind of, I could see why they might be uh, wanting to join Russia just so they get more of a pension. And you have to remember that here, the GDP per capita in 2014 was about one third of the countries further to the west and to the north, we'll say, uh, that have joined the European Union. Now, since independence, I, you know, I talked about obviously the lowering of the Soviet flag over the Kremlin on this day in 1991. Basically, Ukraine had hung out in this kind of Russia, Russian influence space, you know, with Belarus. Uh, Russia and then some of the other former Soviet republics, but countries in the Baltics that have been in the Soviet Union, like Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, along with obviously countries of the Warsaw Pact in Central Europe, like uh, Poland, Hungary and the Czech Republic, Slovakia, they joined the European Union and they reformed their economies and they had massive economic growth because here at the fall of communism, the GDP per capita was more or less the same between Poland and Ukraine and in fact Ukraine was seen as the country of the future of the region because it had so much industry and good infrastructure relative to the other countries around it but it hasn't turned out that way at all and you know in general people across the world are pretty much the same in terms of their basic needs and wants which is they want to put chlib isil on the table as they say in Ukrainian bread and salt right they basically want to have a quiet life and you know feed their families and get on with things and have perspectives and the issue here is that by uh taking uh you know the elite here basically running the country and being in this kind of post-soviet space of being closer to russia led to the people here basically being a hell of a lot poorer than their you know neighbors if it happens to be in Poland or in the Baltics, which was even in, you know, in the Soviet Union. And as a result of that, a lot of Ukrainians, also a lot of Belarusians, started to go to Poland to work or to the Baltics to work. And when they get there, do you think that they look at the Poles, they look at the Lithuanians and they think, oh, these people are three times smarter than us? No, I don't think they do. They might have a little bit of a lure uh, towards Germans or French or Western Europeans, but definitely not to other people in the region. And they realize the main difference is that Poland and the Baltic countries like Lithuania, Estonia and Latvia, they joined the European Union and the Ger European Union expands with the prospect, the promise of greater prosperity. So that is really at the key of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine because and President Putin keeps talking about, you know, he writes this 5,000 word essay, emotional essay about, you know, they're one people, the Belarusians, the Ukrainians and the Russians. That may be true that, especially in this region, there are a lot of historical links and people have families on both sides of the border. But then you have to ask, well, why don't Ukrainians at the moment seem to really want to be with Russia over here? And they actually want to be with the European Union over here. Well, it comes down to economics. They see, in general, not those babushki waving the Soviet flags, obviously. If you hang out with them all the time, that's probably the only uh, narrative you get. But on the Sunday, the day after, there was actually a pro-Ukrainian unity uh, gathering. It was quite large over in uh, Park Shevchenko. I remember this is in 2014. And there you had, you know, families from the young people to the old people together, kind of more... I'd say tranquil, not as aggressively shouting Ukraina as the, the babushkas and the other younger guys were shouting Russia, um, uh, you know, the day before. And that kind of shows that and for most people, they're primarily concerned about the economics and having a better life. And basically it comes down to the fact that Russia hasn't provided, uh, by hanging out in Russia, with kind of in the Russian sphere of influence, hasn't worked out economically for Ukraine. So, I think for a lot of Ukrainians, when I speak to them at least, they seem to be more like, yeah, especially in this region where people have families on both sides of the border, as I said, they're kind of like, well, we've been in Russia for a long time. 
it hasn't really worked out, so let's give the other side a go. I mean, it worked out for Poland and Estonia and Lithuania and all those kind of countries uh, in terms of their economics. So that is really the key that is driving, you know, Ukraine more westwards. Of course, there are people in the west of Ukraine who don't have the same connection with Russia and, and Belarus and other countries around it. They have more of a history, you know, with Central Europe. And you see that in the architecture when you go through. But that's kind of the big thing. Now, on the flip side, I mentioned all those Ukrainian Belarusians going to countries like in the Baltics that were in the Soviet Union or Poland that was in the Warsaw Pact also had communism. What do you think would happen if Ukraine became like, say, the countries in the Baltics or Poland? Like its GDP per capita increases threefold over the next 10 years. What do you think would happen? in Russia. <laughs> a bit like what has happened here. People are going to be looking, why are we poor compared to those Ukrainians, right? What's different in the system over there? And especially if they start traveling and, uh, you know, working. I'm not sure the, <laughs> the Ukrainians would give them work permits like the Poles and the Lithuanians have given Ukrainian and Belarusians work visas, but you get my drift. They'll probably start demanding some changes as well. So it's really an economic issue at the core of it, right? That's driving this tension uh, in the region. And the other big thing, I mean, I'm trying to distill it down to make it a little bit easier to follow it. I mean, obviously this is a very complicated, you know, geopolitical situation. The other big thing is the change in the military balance because back in 2014, Ukraine didn't really have an army. Also in 2015, they started to develop it. And, you know, Russia just basically grabbed uh, Crimea in the chaos that was after the uh, revolution here and I read some of those you know only about 6,000 active Ukrainian soldiers ready to defend the country which is basically minuscule but that's true or not as an exact figure there were very few they had some volunteer battalions obviously then came and ordinary Ukrainians volunteered but that situation has changed dramatically in the last couple of years and the Ukrainian military is getting stronger and stronger. Now, it's not up to the point that it can, you know, resist a full-blown Russian invasion, but it would be very, very costly for Russia. And the window of opportunity for that military option is actually closing quite quickly because, you know, Ukraine just purchased some drones from Turkey that were quite effective in another conflict in the region in Nagorno-Karabakh, um, you know, dispute between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Uh, last year and they have those drones and they're planning to develop their Navy and their Air Force so perhaps in a couple of years there wouldn't even realistically be a military option left and you might be asking as response that well why would they want to use a military option while well, they don't really have political options uh, left Karl von Clausewitz who wrote from Krieger on war summed it up War is the extension of politics by other means, right? If you don't have political options, then countries start to think about a military option. And since the economic model is pushing, or the economics of the region are pushing Ukraine closer and closer to the West, or the people in general want to go that direction, well, Russia is kind of running out of options and how to keep persuade them to stay in their sphere of influence, right? So that's kind of the two main core issues that are driving, you know, the tension right now at the moment you know because we've had this conflict for more or less eight years in the region uh, and now it's come to real head in terms of the headlines and you know it's been out of the international media for a long time so let's walk maybe up to Park Shevchenko in that direction and we'll go a little bit more in depth and I'll as I said let you know what I think is going to happen so it's 30 years since the fall of the Soviet Union Basically, you could say on this day, there were several days that it fell on uh, over the course of 1991, especially in December. There's a few dates to remember, but this is kind of the last day, the 25th of December. And as I said, Ukraine was kind of hanging out in Russia's sphere of influence, more or less, obviously going back and forth. You know, they had a pro-EU president after the Orange Revolution in 2004, but then Yanukovych, who was more... Russia friendly, was elected in 2010, obviously then you in 2014 you had another revolution where he lost power. What was the, the cause of that revolution? Again it comes back down to economics. He was 
he had run in a mandate, Viktor Yanukovych, when he got elected in 2010, to sign an association agreement with the European Union and also a deep and compre comprehensive free trade agreement, uh, basically to bring them closer to the European Union's economic orbit. And Russia had started an alternative to join the European Union, which is basically to have an economic and political union with Russia, which is called the Eurasian Economic Union. And whilst it'd be nice to think that you can hang out with both of those, in reality you can't. Once you join one of those organizations, basically you're precluded from joining the other one. You can't really do that. Now the economic situation, as I said, is that, well, countries in the Baltics have a GDP per capita. Now it's probably about four times higher than Ukraine today. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was looking at the GDP per capita for Russia and for Moscow, because I have this uh, program where I help guys moving to Russia and that we're doing at the moment online, uh, Slavic Utopia Secrets Russia. And in fact, the GDP, GDP per capita of Moscow is basically roughly around the same, but not a, a little bit lower than in the Baltics as a whole, right? So the size of, economic size of joining the Eurasian Economic Union is kind of dwarfed by economic size of joining the European Union. So the economic argument isn't there to join the Eurasian Economic Union. I mean, it's more a cultural argument, right, that they have these historic ties together as peoples. And how, well, then you would think, well, just Ukraine chooses what to do, right? It's a sovereign nation. It can, uh, it can just join uh, whichever one of the two it wants. Well, unfortunately, that's not how things have been developing in this region, right? Uh, while you get free choice, uh, if you have a big, strong neighbor, only if you basically have very good, you decide to join with them, or <laughs> you have the military uh, to take another route. So let me explain kind of the background of how, you know, countries in the Baltics managed to join the European Union and why for Ukraine it's been so difficult to make, you know, that decision. So back in 2000 and probably about early 2005, I was actually invited to a, I guess you'd call a meeting by President Putin in the US. He was trying to do a bit of a charm offensive with, you know, future, what he thought were going to be future US policymakers. So I got invited to this because I was, as I said, studying international relations with a specialization in the field in the US. And around the same time, I also went to dinner with the former president of Estonia. Yes, uh, Lenit Meri. If you fly into Tallinn today, the airport is named after him. And at the time in Washington DC, amongst policymakers, amongst just people who are studying this field, President Putin was actually really popular. Seems very surprising today. And you see all the hysteria about him in the media, amongst policymakers as well in Europe and European Union and in US. But it was pretty different back then because he had stabilized Russia. He was seen to have stabilized Russia after the chaotic years of Yeltsin's rule in the, in the 90s. And at this dinner with Lenin Mary, who has since passed away, he told me something that has always stuck with me. He said, one day Russia will be strong again and it will invade every country in the former Soviet Union that is not in NATO and doesn't do what it wants, right? So he then told me that the reason that he joined NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, was because he didn't believe that if Russia, a resurgent Russia, were to invade Estonia, that France and Germany would come to save them, to protect them, and he wanted an American military guarantee, right? So if you don't know what NATO is, NATO was basically a collective defense organization during the Cold War. One side you had Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact facing off basically in Central Europe, um, East Germany and West German border running down through the continent there. And basically it was the Western European countries and America and Canada basically having a defensive pact. And you know, it kind of served its purpose, both of them. They didn't 
overtly fight each other and have an invasion further during the Cold War. Now, you might be saying, well, that was when the Soviet Union was around, and now we're 30 years later. So why the hell do we... There's no Warsaw Pact, so why do we have NATO anymore? And that's a very good question, because NATO had an existential crisis. It didn't really have a raison d'etre, a reason to continue to exist in the 1990s once Russia, uh, you know, the successor state to the Soviet Union, was not in a position uh, to go and invade or attack its neighbors militarily very much. And that's kind of what happened with the organization. It, you know, had this, um, there was an expression, NATO needs to either go out of zone, out of region, out of area, I think is what they said, out of area or out of business, because really the reason for it to keep going wasn't there if Russia wasn't, you know, a security threat to Western Europe. And later on, as you know, countries such as Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, who are in the Soviet Union, and other countries that have been in the Warsaw Pact, so like Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, I mean, it was Czechoslovakia at the time, they decided to join NATO, right? And why would they do that? You know, Russia's not a threat. Well, it's exactly what the former Estonian president said to me. They were worried that in the future, Russia would be a threat and France and Germany weren't going to come and save them. Uh, now the European Union actually has a mutual uh, defense clause as well, a uh, bit, bit similar to Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, which is basically attack on one is attack on all. So basically the idea is that if someone attacks Estonia, then America and the other countries in NATO are obliged to come and save them, right? So that is why Ukraine, since it wants to join the European Union, Russia doesn't want it. They feel the only way to prevent it, prevent Russia militarily stopping them, is to join NATO. Uh, that way that if Russia invades again, <laughs> as we're, this is the topic of this video, then, well, first of all, it just won't happen because, you know, there's a risk of nuclear war and all that, and it just makes it crazy, uh, a crazy gamble to take. It just makes it madness. It's already madness to think about another invasion here anyways, but definitely if they're in NATO, that would just make it kind of beyond the pale in terms of thinking about it. So that is why Ukraine pushes to join NATO. Now, NATO is not, you know, as I said, they needed to go out of area or out of business. It's not like they're doing it as a charity. <laughs> they're not protecting Estonia because, you know, it's not in their interests. And one of those interests is, of course, you know, they can put military bases all in the region. And what can they do with those military bases? They can project military power. Um, not just here in Europe, but also in other parts of the world, right? You might be saying, well, why do, we, why do Europeans allow them to do that? Well, it's quite simply Europeans don't take care of their own defense. There's no European Union army as yet. Well, we'll see what happens in the years to come. And if that were the case, then that would basically mean that uh, NATO wouldn't really have uh, much of an argument to stay in Europe, especially if Europeans started to pay for that defense. You probably heard former US President Donald Trump talking about the 3% uh, that countries in NATO are supposed to spend on their defense, that they don't in Europe in general, very few of them, and that they should start paying. Yes, I agree. But the thing is, if they start paying for the defense, then they won't want to have the Brits and the Americans here uh, anywhere in Europe, obviously with their military, because if you're paying for it, why do you want those foreign troops? It's kind of a trade-off, basically. You don't have to pay for your security because you've outsourced it, but the downside is, of course, then you have foreign military that on your soil that might start to do things that are not necessarily in your interest, right? Anyways, I digress a little bit. So for Ukraine, they perceive, at least the current government, that wants to join the European Union, that the way to do that is to basically have a strong military protection and NATO would be a way to achieve that. Now, it's not like you can just join NATO tomorrow. They all have to agree, all the members, and then obviously there's what's called a membership membership action plan that takes years. So you kind of give Russia a big heads up about what's about to happen. And uh, the fear in NATO has always been that Russia would invade if they thought that was going to happen. So since the Eurasian Economic Union and European Union are mutually exclusive, you might think, well, can they just do neither? 
That's kind of what um, you know, Russia has been trying to say. They ha there's a phenomenon called Finlandization. Basically, uh, Finland during the Cold War was non-aligned, but it was basically what we would say controlled by the Soviet Union, which is why the Soviet Union didn't invade it or put uh, troops there to, um, like they did in the other Warsaw, Warsaw Pact countries like Poland and Czech Republic or East Germany. But basically, they had to give up their foreign policy. The problem for Ukraine is Finlandization, which is kind of what you saw with the peace agreements in Donbass, or the, the kind of structure, which is called the Minsk Accords. Uh, it basically allows Russia a veto. The fact, you know, in, in reality, allows them a veto over Ukrainian foreign policy. Um, part of that foreign policy is to join the European Union. Um, and the issue there is if they don't push to join the European Union, well, what's going to change economically here, right? Probably very little. Corruption is going to still be endemic and rife, and uh, their standard of living is just not going to catch up with the rest of Europe. So it's kind of like, yeah, they can agree to Finlandization, uh, and that's actually why Russia has become um, part of the reason, along with saying that the military balance changing, is the fact that, you know, by not implementing the Minsk Accords, Ukraine is able to delay longer and longer <laughs> any sort of Finlandization and then in the meantime you know rearm and develop its military and basically get in a position where they don't have to agree to it at all so that is how that all plays in um, with NATO so let me answer kind of four or five questions that I'm often asked uh, by clients or by other people who are interested in the region as we walk probably back to the center of Archive here. So one of the first questions I'm always asked is why does NATO keep expanding eastwards when they promise not to? Well, and NATO is a, an aggressive, an American-led um, coalition that attacks other countries. Now, as I alluded to earlier, in the 2000s, NATO had this mantra uh, go out of region or go out of business, probably I'm paraphrasing that, but something along those lines. And they did use NATO as a structure when there was a military intervention in Kosovo, if you remember, in 1999. So I guess it was still in the, in the very late 90s. Now, the American uh, military planners were not happy with that at all as a structure. And if you remember with the invasion of Iraq, they used the coalition of the willing not NATO, because France wasn't, is a member of NATO and was not going to agree to it. So, uh, whilst it's true that NATO is sometimes used for aggressive, um, offensive military op operations, not defensive, it's not really how it's used, primarily when US and UK or other European countries actually want to pursue a more aggressive foreign uh, policy in general. And Let's be frank, they're not going to invade Russia, <laughs> right? That would be madness of all. Obviously, Russia is a nuclear state and uh, no one questions its current borders or anything. So, um, well, I shouldn't have said that because Ukraine could, you know, well, Russia, its internationally recognized borders are not in question, should we say. <laughs> Obviously, the ones where Crimea uh, are by Ukraine. So, there's also no treaty to say that NATO cannot expand. As I said, when I talked about Leonard Mary, uh, he wanted to invite the Americans to protect him from a possible uh, future Russian invasion of Estonia and seeing what's happened in Ukraine, you know, which doesn't join NATO, wasn't given that option, then yeah, that was pretty pertinent, right? So, as I said, with the European Union expanding with the promise of prosperity for its new member states. NATO expands with the promise of security. Now, of course, there's dual, you know, they can use all that infrastructure, military bases for offensive purposes. But at the end of the day, they're not actually going to invade Russia or anything like that. What it is a problem for Russia, though, is once say NATO, well, let's say Ukraine joins or whatever, or the other countries that are there, then Russia is not in a position to tell those countries what to do anymore in terms of their foreign policy or to invade them. That is really 
the bigger issue with the expansion of NATO. And as I said, President Putin is actually even now starting to acknowledge that there's no agreement. He keeps complaining about it. <laughs> there's no agreement that they can't expand. He keeps talking about some conversation, you know, in the Soviet Union, in the final days of the Soviet Union, that they wouldn't expand, go one east, one inch eastward. Listen, there's a thing called the Budapest Memorandum, 1994, which says that the countries that signed it, US, UK, France, and Russia, have to respect Ukrainian, Belarusian, and Kazakhstani sovereignty in exchange for those countries giving up their nuclear arsenal, right? All the nuclear weapons that were left here. And obviously by annexing Crimea, Russia is not respecting that written treaty. So yeah, complaining about the treaty that doesn't exist because you like it and you don't want NATO to expand, well, that kind of doesn't really convince, sound very convincing, does it? So, yeah, so that's the thing about Russia and NATO expanding eastwards. They're sovereign countries, they're free to expand the same way that other countries can join a pro, I know, a Russian-led military alliance as well, if they're independent and they decide to make, the, you know, make that decision. So the next claim that actually President Putin made again this week when he had his press conference is that NATO wants to put missiles in Ukraine to threaten Russia, right? Uh, the first thing is Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia, Poland already boarding Russia with the Kaliningrad exclave and you know Narva in Estonia is about 150 kilometers from St. Petersburg, Russia's second city. So they definitely don't need Ukraine in order to put any missiles. Never mind the fact that obviously you can fire missiles from a lot further away, but yeah. Ukraine being in say a NATO alliance, I mean it creates an extra border uh, in this part, maybe a little bit closer to other parts of Russia. But even Moscow is equidistant to U the Ukrainian border as it is to the Latvian border. And, you know, the Kaliningrad exclave is completely surrounded by, well, the, the Baltic Sea, Poland and Lithuania. So they definitely don't need Ukraine to put missiles in. Now, what Russia historically is worried about is what results from the Great European Plain, which is a plain that runs all the way from the Ural Mountains in Russia to basically Amsterdam uh, through the Baltics and into northern France. And traditionally, you wanted that border to be as narrow as possible so that you had to, uh, you didn't have to spend as much resources uh, defending it. So pushing that border, you know, like it was during the Cold War, all the way to West Germany at the time, uh, definitely narrows that. But just, uh, you know, if Ukraine joins the Russian sphere of influence and, you know, a Russian alliance, uh, that border is not really that much smaller, right? So that, in this case, doesn't really make much sense. They'd have to keep going further and further westwards in order to do that. So uh, missiles, NATO doesn't need Ukraine to put missiles in it uh, to threaten Russia. It can do that already from a lot of other places. Now, the second thing, because as I mentioned, President Putin brought it up in his press conference, he said, well, how would America like it if we put missiles basically in Mexico or Canada? Well, is America planning to invade Canada or Mexico at the moment? Because if they were, they wouldn't be very happy about it. <laughs> That's the main reason, because it's a deterrence. And then he brought up that in the past, you know, US fought wars uh, with Canada and Mexico, and they actually annexed part of Mexico, right? He mentioned Texas and uh, California. Uh, I don't really know why he wanted to bring that up, because that was in the 19th century. It's the War of 1812 between the US and Canada and the Mexican-American War of 1848 because that is exactly a great illustration of why a country that's beside a big power would want to join something like NATO. So what happened is Canada was kind of like in the NATO of the day, right? It was protected, it was in an alliance with the United Kingdom, with Great Britain. And what happened when those dastardly Americans crossed over the Niagara Falls to invade Canada and essentially try to annex parts of it? Well, they got their asses kicked by the British and they got sent back across the other side. But in Mexico, they didn't have 
that alliance. They didn't have that protector. And yeah, US invaded and annexed California in that territory. And President Putin was saying that, you know, no one talks about that anymore. Well, it was in the 19th century and they signed treaties afterwards. But <laughs> that's the whole point. The US was an, I mean, you can still argue it still is an imperial power, but it was invading and annexing its neighbors that were weaker than that. And that's pretty much when he, you know, what he's talking about with Crimea. So I was a bit surprised he wanted to say that uh, so out loud that, yeah, it's basically the reason to join NATO illustrated perfectly with America's own history. So the next thing I hear is that Ukraine should just be neutral, it should just be like, say, Switzerland. Well, it's not very realistic to be like Switzerland if you think that Switzerland is mainly mountainous, it does have a bit of a plain. Uh, on one part of it, it's basically mountainous, it has traditionally a big military, right, and it doesn't have neighbors at the moment who want to invade it, right, it did maybe in the 1930s with Nazi Germany, right? And that's just not an option for Ukraine. That's kind of what they've been trying to do um, in terms of developing their military and they can't move mountains here, uh, you know, outside of their Carpathians. They got the great European plain. So there's also an expression that tell me a country's geography and I will tell you its foreign policy, right? So Switzerland's in a position to do that. Uh, no one's planning to invade them, so it's pretty easy to be kind of neutral in that sense. And they're not really exactly neutral. They're obviously still, to a certain extent, integrated in Western structures because that's where they're located. So that, unfortunately, is not really possible. As I said, Russia would prefer Finlandization, which is basically encroachment, uh, controlling its foreign policy and eventually just take it over anyways. But being neutral, not possible. Eurasian Economic Union and European Union are mutually exclusive and basically you're going to have to join one or the other. And the same goes for thinking that, well, Ukraine should just give up on Donbass and uh, the parts of Donbass that are controlled by the separatists, by Russia and Crimea, and everything will be fine. <laughs> that won't work either because at the end of the day, Russia needs a wants in its current form to keep expanding westwards and stop them joining the U European Union and NATO. So that's also not going to work in terms of just saying, hey, we're neutral, let's draw a border here. It's not really going to be realistic. The idea of the Minsk Accords is to control uh, Ukraine's foreign policy. So they'll basically just end up and absorbed into some sort of Russian um, backed or led um, union and again the issue is economics that's what it comes down to they lose that possibility to become like the Baltics and have a higher GDP per capita potentially than even Moscow with all the resources that they can you know uh, send there from other parts of Russia so let me just answer the last one that comes up a lot is about Crimea and why Russia annexed Crimea. So some people believe that it's about, you know, having some sort of warm water port. Russia has lots of warm water ports. One of them is even right beside Crimea at uh, is it Novy Rosisk. So they didn't need it for a warm water port. They have those. Um, they had a lease on a military port, right? So for the military in Sevastopol, or Sevastopol as we normally say in English. And they had that, I think, until 2042 was the lease. And basically, they were worried about two things when there was a revolution in 2014. First one being that a new Ukrainian government might say, well, we're going to cancel the lease, and you got to leave there. And that's a possibility that they might say that actually happened between Ireland and the United Kingdom. Ireland also had signed to give Britain some, you know, a port or two in Ireland. And then at a certain point, there was a change of government. They told them to leave. Now, the UK did leave there. But, you know, if the Ukrainian government had said, you got to leave, I don't think that was happening, at least until the end of the lease in 2042. The bigger issue was that, well, what happens if Ukraine allows NATO or the US to put its military bases also in Crimea, right? That would limit uh, 
Russia's ability to project military power and basically tell Ukraine and other countries in the region what to do. <laughs> so that is what the real reason is. They were just worried that, yeah, they'd lose their military advantage in the Black Sea and actually by annexing Crimea, obviously they extend that uh, quite a bit. So that is the main reason why Crimea was annexed. Yeah, in summary, that's an overview of the political situation here and what's been driving. There are other things like uh, Russia wants to get the Nord Stream gas pipeline directly to Germany approved. And this is kind of leverage all this shenanigans and troops at the border. There's supposed to be whatever, 100,000 on the other side of the border just waiting to come. And now definitely the media in general, they make money by selling out space and sensationalism is the best way to get you to click and stuff. So definitely they have an incentive to uh, exaggerate the threat or sensationalize it in order to get, uh, I'm talking about the Western media, to get you to click and make more money. Thing is, as I speak Russian and I watch, you know, the Russian leaders on their television, well, they're just as sensationalist. <laughs> they keep, they're definitely not reassuring when you watch them. Uh, whether it's President Putin or someone else in the government, they keep kind of insinuating all these or directly threatening uh, all these casus, uh, casus belli, right? So reasons for war, there's a genocide being planned in Ukraine, there are Nazis who have taken over the country. I'm not sure how many Nazis you've seen in the background when I walk around. I'm still waiting to see them after eight years. And you know, the rhetoric is pretty stern and President Putin at the time looks very emotional. Him and Medvedev, they both wrote kind of opinion pieces about basically why Ukraine should be part of their, their under their control uh, in the last few months. So definitely this theory is not coming from nowhere uh, because they're definitely, both sides are, you know, jacking, ratcheting up the tension and the rhetoric, also the US by, and the actual hysteria is a good thing because it, I think, reduces the chances for a conflict, um, you know, greater military conflict because unlike in 2014 when the West was a bit disorganized and surprised that Russia annexed Crimea and the war in Donbass started, uh, this time there's gonna be no surprise, right? So they've already coordinated, agreed more or less a response, uh, a policy to do, implement if that happens that will push up the costs for russia and hopefully you know it won't come to that so that brings me on to whether russia will invade ukraine in 2022 i don't have a direct line to president putin or president Zelensky here in ukraine uh, or to joe biden <laughs> or to lukashenko or to anyone else in the region so i can't tell you uh, obviously 100% what's going to happen, what they're really t thinking of doing. But I can give you, as I've outlined here, you know, a bit of an educated um, assessment of the potential. I just think that the cost of a full-blown invasion of Ukraine by Russia will be crazy expensive, both in terms of material, lives lost, popularity in Russia. I can't imagine Russians being gung-ho to see you know, both their own uh, soldiers coming back in body bags and you know, a lot of Ukrainians suffering as well. And I don't think you can really, I mean, maybe you can, maybe I'm being naive, but I don't think you can really keep that under wraps. I think it would just be catastrophic. And then, yeah, they probably could win a military victory, but then the issue is trying to occupy it and make it a success afterwards, because Donbass is not a success. No one's moving to the Luhansk People's Republic or the Donetsk People's Republic en masse or even to Crimea. So what would that be like if there was even a bigger military conflict here? It would be catastrophic. So likewise with my client here, what I told him, you know, you need to consider all the possibilities and, you know, maybe there will be a military escalation. Uh, it'd be pretty mad. It doesn't seem very rational to do that. Then again, Putin looks a bit emotional all the time when he talks about Ukraine. Feels maybe he's running out of time in the future. You know, Ukraine joins the European Union that he'll be the Russian president who lost Ukraine. So, could go either way. I just think that a full-blown invasion would be crazy uh, when you look at the costs for Russia, uh, for Ukraine and everyone involved. So hopefully, hopefully calmer heads prevail 
and we don't have any escalation. In the meantime, we should do what I'm doing. Come to the region, come to Ukraine. Uh, as I said, we had a phenomenal weekend last weekend with my clients. Uh, with my client here and clients before that, the last group who was here in Kharkiv. And uh, got probably another client coming already in a few weeks again, uh, time in January. So uh, it's a fantastic place, Kharkiv. It's getting better and better. They're definitely making some good developments here with the city. Nightlife is top. So uh, yeah, get on a plane and come to Ukraine. So fingers crossed, everything stays good and there's no absolutely crazy escalation in you know, the tension here and normal Ukrainians and Russians can get along with their daily lives. Actually, I'm just coming up to a Catholic church here in the center of Kharkiv, which is apt way to finish up this video as today is the 25th of December and it is the Catholic Christmas. So, if you are celebrating it, Merry Christmas, enjoy the season with friends and family and hopefully we see peace in this part of the world. Disvedanya, dopopachna. See you in the next video. It might even be a cool vlog from Kharkiv here in Ukraine. Ciao ciao. Sar experience.